So hello and uh, welcome everyone at our panel on higher education. Uh, and uh, we're very glad to, to have you all here today. Um, yeah, so we will be talking about global neoliberal transformation of higher education. Uh, and uh, we have four speakers today, uh, which is really good. We have very different perspectives. We have uh, perspectives both from more theoretical uh, side but, and from the more activist side, from our local Ukrainian context um, and also from different parts of the world, uh, such diverse contexts as uh, Pakistan, uh, some South, Afri South African experience, uh, Latin American experience, um, and also Western Europe and North America. And so it's very good to, to be able to uh, look at what's happening in higher education globally. Because of course, on the one hand, we have very different um, histories uh, in origins of universities or structures and functioning. Uh, if we look at, for example, post-Soviet countries or you know, Latin America, uh, countries of the global South, we would see very different trajectories and some significant differences. Uh, but also there are some global trends that um, are quite similar towards the precarization of academic work, the commercialization of knowledge, the narrowing of access to higher education. Um, and so um, we felt it was it would be important to bring uh, people who are interested in those questions, both theoretically and, and practically, who are involved uh, in student activism, uh, for example, to, to discuss uh, this. Uh, and uh, yeah, Maria um, Ivanchiva, one of our speakers, just at the beginning of, of this panel, she asked, uh, why did we include the, the, the topic of, of higher education in, in the conference uh, and why do, do we find it uh, important? And of course, uh, this topic was important for the editorial board of Commons Spielne since the very beginning of, of the functioning of our journal, of our editorial team. Uh, we've had many activists from the Premadia Student Union, for example, at the very beginning uh, of, of our um, uh, Commons uh, journal back in uh, 2010 already. One of the paper issues, one of the early paper issues, number three, was about uh, uh, the politics of education. And we had many contributions already in that issue uh, from uh, student activists, both in Ukraine and um, in other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, with uh, the full-scale invasion, um, we, uh, we see, um, interestingly, uh, a kind of a rebirth or an activization of the student movement in Ukraine, uh, and also um, a desire of our students uh, and uh, uh, also of academics who are involved in, um, in higher education to form links with uh, their colleagues, their comrades, uh, other students, other uh, academics uh, in, in different parts of the world, in different regions, uh, including um, the, the global periphery, so to say, uh, so, um, as many of you know, in, in commons with the start of uh, Russia's full-scale uh, invasion, we, we have been working on a project on the global peripheries, trying to forge more direct uh, links with uh, activists in the global south. Uh, so, to kind of um, have a detour around the, the, kind of the production of knowledge just, just in the global north uh, and kind of what many of us were doing prior to the full-scale invasion is just looking up to all these scholars in the global north and what they have to say, but also to share our experiences more and more horizontally. Um, so it's, it's very good to, to be able to, to do that. And just a few weeks ago, um, there was a, a meeting uh, in, in Lviv of, uh, on the topic of universities at war and, and the question of what role does education um, have to play uh, in in the context uh, of war, and that um, that is also one of the points we can uh, talk about um, today. Yeah, so uh, so I think what we will be doing is we'll be analyzing all these transformations that we are talking about, and the precarization of academic work, commercialization of knowledge, and so on, and the origins and causes of these transformations, um, and and also. Uh, does the current situation allows for, for allow for the emergence of global struggles for the post-capitalist university? That's one of the key questions that you could have read in the announcement for the panel. Uh, and 
I will now introduce my our first speaker today, and it is Maria Ivancheva. Uh, so Maria is originally from Bulgaria, and currently she uh, works at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, uh, and she is also a member of the Left East and Left Fem collectives. Uh, and last year, she published a monograph, "The Alternative University: Lessons from Bolivaria and Venezuela." Uh, so um, it would be really uh, cool to hear from Maria uh, on, on the experiences uh, of her fieldwork in, in Venezuela and also the research that she has done in South Africa and in the UK. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, we're hoping both for, uh, we're looking uh, for both an, an overview of the current trends and developments in higher education and the, kind of the specific cases um, that that would be really um, helpful. Yeah, thank you, Maria. So the floor is yours. Um, and oh, also before Maria starts, uh, just how we will proceed some organizational matters. Uh, so we have four presenters and each of the presenters will have uh, 15 to 20 minutes for the presentation. Uh, and then uh, we will, uh, I will kind of ask everyone to comment on each other's uh, presentations if anybody will have something to add just for one or two minutes. And we will open the floor uh, for discussion. So all of you, as you're listening uh, to the presentations, you're welcome to write your comments and your questions right away. Uh, you don't have to wait for the end. You can write them in the Q&A section. So at any point during the, the conference, so they will appear in the Q&A section. And then after the presentations, um, I will read them out. You're welcome to write the questions both in English or Ukrainian as you prefer. Um, I can translate uh, and when I'm reading out, I, I can read them out in English. All of our presenters today um, will be speaking in English. Uh, so those of you who would like to join in the Ukrainian language uh, section and haven't done so yet, there is uh, a Ukrainian um, channel. So if you would prefer to hear the presentation in translation, that's um, then you have an opportunity to, to switch channels now if you haven't already done so. Good, and we have uh, one hour and 45 minutes. So uh, now it is 6.15 in, in Kiev and will be eight, ending at 8 p.m. Good, okay, sorry, Maria. So now the floor is yours. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Anastasia, and thanks comrades, colleagues, friends from Spione for having me here and uh, allowing me to be part of this very, I think, important conversation. And I'll say a few things to start with, and then I kind of move to the presentation. And one is that, um, whereas, so I'm in a strange positionality here. I'm, I'm both from Eastern Europe and I've studied other peripheries, but I'm based in the core and my research is now mostly focusing on the core. So instead of going to the peripheries, I actually start the presentation itself. We'll focus on tendencies that I think are happening in the core that we should all be very, very alert about because they might spread like wildfire very quickly. And then I think I'll focus on some peripheral developments and articulations more in the discussion, which, uh, you know, we can speak about resistance or the role of the university in, in peripheral contexts, which are different than the core. And then the other thing I want to say is that I'm, I'm speaking as, first and foremost, as a, a researcher of universities in different contexts, like and as I said, you know, I've studied Venezuela, I've studied South Africa, I've also studied Ireland, United Kingdom, and I have studied socialist education and its opposition, anti-socialist education, which we are having now around the world um, increasingly. Um, but I've also been an activist in and outside education, and I always think of higher education as a field of class struggle. So for me, studying higher education is just a field site for studying and engaging in resistance, and it doesn't um, have to be kind of an obsession with the university as a place to kind of really wage resistance, because there is always this hand and deck issue with, with higher education, which is, is it a site of reproduction or a site of resistance? And I never think of it as being either, or I think of it as being both. At present, we have those of us who are in higher education and who have some security 
are in the privileged position to have at least some stability and security to struggle on behalf of everybody else. And I don't think we're doing a great job in that. So these these are the kind of, you know, thinking of which are the the strong points and which are the weak points that we are encountering. Uh, and so I'm focusing on the UK as a case study, and I I imagine that all of you, you know, the first thing is like, why do, do we care about this? <laughs> you know, enough of the UK, enough of this capitalist country, and it's higher education system that's always kind of positioned as some kind of um, ideal up to which other countries have to live up, you know. And and I, I think there is, I, I can understand that frustration, but I think there's also something there that, that we're missing, which is that I think unlike uh, other advanced capitalist countries, especially like the US, Australia to a certain extent, you know, in the English language space. What we have in in um, the UK higher education system as a system is a huge, massified, accessible, it used to be, you know, system with more than six, uh, 160 higher education institutions that at least for some time that's contained at the end of the last century, managed to combine two things that were quite difficult, which is quality and equitable access. And this is something very important to remember when we're speaking about public higher education. We turn back to places like the UK and Germany to teach any lessons in higher education, not because of their excellent research, because that's mostly, um, you know, a, a extractivist result and result of brain drain and, you know, migration and uh, inequality. But what they really managed to do for some time is to use higher education as a redistributive practice. And it was because of movements and because of socialistic, if not socialist necessarily, tendencies that this was happening in the post-war period. And that they had a lot of progressive forms like distance learning, vocational training in polytechnics, adult and continuing education, further education institutions, of which we now see crumbling forms, and some of which were partly emulated in some peripheral context. For instance, Venezuela didn't learn from Cuba or from the Soviet Union, to my surprise. It learned from the Open University in the UK. So the person who established the Bolivarian University that I studied and I'll mention a bit later, did an extended research stay at the Open University and tried to learn lessons from it. So this is something kind of interesting to bear in mind. Um, and I'm going to quote a bit from an article that I co-authored with um, David Harvey and Robert Ovetz, which is called The Political Economy of the Public University, or other book chapter in an encyclopedia just emerging with the promise of mass access to equitable higher education outside the ivory tower or exclusive Ivy League and Oxbridge and uh, top research establishment, this global university, which combines research, teaching and service as three components of higher education, poses a serious challenge to the former's domination, which is research's domination in knowledge production and dissemination, which we see today. It also forms the basis on which have been constructed global rankings, evaluation processes, harmonization protocols, and accreditation. The model that others might seek to mimic from an elitist first world perspective, the project has been successful, but that is also the problem that many times we can see that how, how its success has also meant that it has become the victim of its own success. And how did that happen? So these are a number of transformations in the core functions that I've outlined that I think we should kind of bear in mind. And, and I think the UK is a very good place to see how a public, um, public system of higher education is transformed in order to extract and in order to fall into the hands of capital and uh, the hands of private uh, businesses with a very uh, big complicity of the state. So um, first, what happened was that the, you, 
university, which is a very specific figure with very strict hierarchies of power and um, domination of research over teaching and so forth, was made into the dominant model. So all the other forms of learning became subject, you know, professional learning, polytechnical learning. Um, by now, things like the psychotherapy training, which I undertook myself, doesn't happen in other organizations. It happens at university. So that means this becomes the centralized dominant model according to which we structure experiences of any professional learning. And then it becomes also the place where instead of you know, businesses training, you know, investing in training their employees, all the outsource, all the training becomes outsourced on universities, and that becomes also a model for you know that serves businesses, um, which then meant um, you know by the nineteen eighties, uh, the nineteen nineties rather, that the block grant which was given discreetly to university, you know, and at their discretion to decide how to deal with their budgets. Uh, was unbundled or it was split into different parts with teaching depending only on fees. So all our teaching contracts are depending on how much money the university receives from student fees, which was never the case before. And it's still not the case in most of the peripheral universities, which get budgets delegated from states mostly. Research starts depending on fundraising. Uh, which means that even if you are a, on a research contract, you don't get money for research. You have to apply for money for research. So the taxpayer pays money to the state, and then you have to apply to the state to give, or mostly to the state, you know, 90% 90, 90 of all the funding comes from the state, to give you funding. So that's quite an interesting thing. So then you're, you're kind of paid to do an extra layer of work that doesn't guarantee you money for research. And this is an incredible amount of lost hours in which people, for instance, who apply for European funding in institutions who are eligible for them, uh, would spend enormous amount of uh, time, travel, to network, to collaborate and so forth, and only less than 95%, oh, sorry, yeah, 90 uh, less than 5% of these applications are successful. So then it turns out that a lot of, you know, labor, love labor is lost. Um, so um, there's also the way that funding works a lot of time is, in, and those of you who have applied for big projects would know that, but, you know, it's very clear when you sit at a university in the UK, how it works is that, and it's not the same in the US, by the way, uh, is that, more than about 40% of all the money that you can get from a funding body goes into the black box of the university. So it's not distributed towards salary. It's not distributed towards research costs. It just goes into a budget that is dedicated to the university, but you never see any of it. Neither does your school. And who sees that is um, usually real estate developers who and private businesses that can take leases out of money out of buildings, you know, real estate and services that are happening at the university and around it, like dormitories. And then the other issue is that a lot of the research that we do at universities, especially in the natural sciences, are um, patented as businesses. Whenever the collaboration is in which university workers paid by public salaries do research, patents are taken by the private company be it a spin-off or a big transnational corporation that works with the university. So that means that all the profit actually does go back, not to the public, but to corporations. Um, and we also have something that then means, you know, because grant acquisition is so important, we have a buyout model that allows for a certain privileged academics, usually male, usually on permanent contract, to be more de mobile and to not be involved in a lot of the caring that is uh, required for university work. So all the competitive metric driven cyclical audit and accountability models that uh, are now invading higher education and that peripheral countries are still kind of grappling with, but are increasingly suffering from introduction on usually on state level 
uh, on government level for any grants, you know, you have to show some QA publications, uh, some ranking of the university, some collaborations, I don't know what, Scopus or whatever, you know, big um, database published, pu acknowledged publications. So all of this um, is now becoming very much part of a much bigger uh, system in which peripheral countries are not at an advantage because they can't, you know, universities there can't pay, for instance, for open access of publications in certain journals or, um, you know, their visibility isn't great in terms of rankings because of that. And so there is an enormous expenditure of time and emotional resources. And this is, you know, both within the kind of creating disparity between cores and peripheries, but also within cores, there are core and peripheral institutions. So for instance, I come from an institution that is in the middle of that, you know, we're kind of not really extremely peripheral, but we're not one of the quote unquote top universities. So we have to do both. We have to do a lot of teaching, but we also have to do a lot of research and have to qualify. And if not, we're going to be closed as a school of education. So, um, Ultimately, this is how research is used to reproduce, you know, funding asymmetries and to discipline and punish more than everything. And so a lot of higher education institutions in a country like the UK with public system are expected to fund at least 75% of capital expenditure from their own cash. So, you know, that, that means huge amount of money, you know, is is required to be kind of fundraised from outside. And then that means research often doesn't happen or is very much dependent on this extractivist logic. Uh, but then what happens in teaching, you know, and that's, that's kind of quite interesting and quite a big topic. And I'm quoting my work here with Alina Courtois and also with Brian Garvey. But um, a lot of the time that model has meant the in increasing casualization of labor and also increasing transformation of how labor is done in academia and and that in teaching lab for teaching labor means that it is done by a specific specific technologies that really reduce it to something else so by annihilation of space and time to provide on demand content accessible anytime from everywhere expectation for an unfettered flow of tr and transmission of knowledge as pure information content that is um, also easily breakable into nano degrees, bite-sized mix, mix and match content. And that requires that every content is disembodied. So even if you teach a class now, you know, I, I, I give you this talk today and tomorrow Christian can chop it up and use it in some of his lectures at another university. And tomorrow I'm going to take parts of his work and, and kind of completely um, reduce it to just say a few quotes and not engage with the whole lot of his work. So it, it means a lot of alienation of what exactly it means to be a teaching body in a classroom. Uh, new surveillance mechanisms, and of course, also a lot of home-based work because we are more and more pushed outside of the premises in which we work. There's increasingly more hot desking. You know, a lot of, so for instance, in my at my school with, where we are a hundred and something like a hundred and ten academics, um, the vast majority of these academics are um, in hot desking, uh, mezzanine floors and there is just a few of us who have offices and by now even full professors have shared offices which means a lot less privacy which means a lot of us are pushed to work at home when we have to do online meetings supervision any kind of sensitive work and that also requires new pastoral caring skills um, so there's a lot in that, and I, I can go into that in, in more detail, but that digitalization has really opened up more and more extraction within that logic as well, in which a lot of um, contracts for especially online tuition are given to big corporations by universities, and uh, they extract an enormous amount of student fees and increasingly higher 
faculty even outside the university. So a lot of the university work is done by faculty that are not even hired and they can be unionized and so forth. And that has meant that university work, university people are split and you know, positions are ever more morphed as Bruce McFarlane said many years ago already. And it also creates quite an enormous split, which is gender and trace based within the academic workforce. And I can speak a bit later about this, but yeah, I, I know I'm kind of running out of time. So I'll just skip this and I can come back to it in the discussion. But uh, so then what it means for students is that there's a always growing kind of fees and always uh, like in the UK that works through loans for some of the students that are especially nationals. Um, but then they have to justify the loans by working for corporations later on, <laughs> for, for private businesses. And there is more and more push to learn vocational skills. So instead of actually having universities produce a kind of uh, more equitable and critical uh, skill training facility, we're more and more turned into vocational training sites. Um, but what's becoming even more interesting and, and kind of uh, paradoxic sad when it comes to the relationship with the peripheries is that we are now seeing a new tendency, which is that countries like the UK are increasingly exploiting people from their co former colonial peripheries in order to first come and pay a lot of money to study. So these are usually for the UK people from Pakistan, from Nigeria, from uh, India, Sri Lanka, and then they would come uh, as a survival strategy very often running from wars and from economic warfare and would be paying a lot of money, thousands of pounds just in fees with the only promise of a post-study visa for two years after this and are exposed uh, increasingly to a housing crisis, to shortages in their children, to long commutes. Um, but also, they, in order to support themselves, they very often end up in the caring economy and do very low skill work, despite very highly skilled you know, academic training. Oops. Huh. And now. Uh, my presentation ended here, so I think I'll come to the other issues later on. Uh, but um, oh, I know if I have to switch this again. But I think um, you know perhaps I can speak in the next round about resistance because I have one more slide that deals with that, and it is important. But perhaps it would be nice to now come to Christian, Mihailo, and Nabil, and I can kind of come to the next part of my presentation later on. Yeah, that's good. Uh, thank you so much, Maria, uh, for your uh, for your presentation. A uh, lot of lot of stuff to, to think about and to, to return to. Uh, I also have your presentation separately, so I will make sure we return to those questions uh, that you didn't have a chance to speak about now in the second uh, round. Uh, yeah, so uh, so thank you. And I will now um, give the floor to Christian, um, Christian Shatkovsky, uh, who is a PhD uh, researcher at the Scholarly Communication Research Group of Adam Mickiewicz University. Uh, and uh, he, his interests cover Marxist political economy and transformations of higher education systems in Central Eastern Europe, as well as the issues of the public and the common in higher education. Uh, so, um, uh, Christian uh, will Hello. continue a little bit from on from Maria uh, with some theoretical insights from uh, Marx's perspective uh, and uh, also one of the questions about knowledge production. In fact, uh, indeed, as uh, Maria mentioned, um, knowledge production is also a site of resistance. And uh, uh, how can we as academics uh, by the work that we're doing, uh, the discussions that we're engaging in, how can we also contribute to um, to the resistance to to those negative, largely negative tendencies that Maria has just outlined? So um, thank you, Christian. The floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, first of all, I will say that I'm sorry because I'm a bit ill. I spent a week of doing intensive seminars and teaching and caring, uh, paradoxically, which not happen often on a research-based contract, but uh, yeah, this is how I ended up. Uh, so, so I confirm with my example also a lot of tendencies that Maria has covered. Uh, I hope to uh, to be clear as much as possible, uh, trying to at the same time, uh, trying to at the same time be uh, brief and slow and I will focus on reading in order to stimulate uh, uh, clear translation. So good evening, my name is Christian Szatkowski and I'm very pleased to join the discussion of the intersection of the peripheries conference. Uh, our conversation is in English, however it is very good that we are talking at all. I believe that today, when most of the Western left does not understand the dangers of the rise of uh, Russian imperialism and its war in our region, there is nothing more important than having this type of dialogue. My intervention focuses on how we can understand capital in higher education, with its core question being uh, the question of capital and global higher education. This is not an empty academic question. I have always been interested in this question only in so far as its illuminates, uh, uh, as its illumination allows us to create an analytical language that facilitates and feeds our common uh, class struggle for a different university and a different society. However, we know that there is no free university in capitalism. A free university under capitalism is like a reading room in prison. This is why, contrary to the suggestion in the description of our meeting, I do not want to refer to it as something post-capitalist, but rather to give it a more positive dimension in line with the Spilne uh, journal title. Uh, and I will be talking about the communist university or university of the common or whatever name we can give it. So today's intervention will be gravitating around to uh, three, seven, uh, three questions. The first a steering one is how to approach capital in higher education, how to capture it, how to describe it. And Maria done extremely well on giving a very concrete description uh, on that. Uh, the second, uh, a more difficult one, uh, which I will develop mainly in the course of a few digressions from the main line of thought, concerns the central peripheral difference in approaching this. Uh, that is, how the manifestation of capitalist subordination in a marketized central, mainly Anglo-Saxon higher, uh, Anglo higher education systems differ from those in peripheral or closer to our post-socialist reality systems. I will also try to indicate where we can look for points of commonalities uh, or where we can find points reinforcing and accelerating the process of capitalist development on the one side and intensification of the development of underdevelopment on the other side of the equation. And third, and finally, at the end of, the, uh, of this intervention, I will point to the student and academic struggles in our part of the world that are taking place within and against capitalist university with the ambition to go beyond its limitations. Some of the answers to these questions can also be found in two books I have recently written, one on capital and higher education and the other coming out soon on the Marxist method of critique uh, for higher education research. Uh, but I find a lot of inspiration for what I do in the writing of Karl Marx. I believe that anyone who wants not only to understand but to change the capitalist reality of higher education should turn to his writings from time to time. When Marx and Engels summarized the method of critique and communism in the German ideology as the real movement which abolishes the present state of things, the conditions of which result from the pre premises that are now in existence, they set us several methodological tasks. Firstly, we need to understand that any critique uh, of higher education, of capital, must find its basis, a platform from which to develop. In my reflections, this is a political ontology. 
the conviction that the basic forms of existence already contain certain political determinations. Let's put it this way. When our basic distinction in talking, talking about higher education is the division between the public and the private, the market and the state, a lot of reality, especially a lot of reality ingrained with its uh, potential for resistance, escapes us. An ontological political reflection allows us, as it allowed Marx, to bring back into the discussion not only labor, but also the common and the commons, a real beyond this modern opposition. It is from this perspective that we can actually find a way to develop and describe struggles of interest that can lay the basis for a post-capitalist order. Secondly, the movement develops within a certain status quo, the capitalist reality of higher education, crisscrossed by contradictions that already well, were well described by Marie. Uh, its analysis addressed by the critic of political is addressed by the critic of political economy. However, this is not, as in many cases uh, of Marx's considerations, a point of arrival. Uh, although it is an important point. Even the best analyzed reality would not crumble under the force of contradictions we discover. The result of the critique of political economy should illuminate the struggles, but also learn from them. And this is the third point, the necessity of following the struggles. The movement described by Marx and Engels develops in untenable, demanding to be abolished antagonistic tension. It fights against. The same is also true of higher education systems. Understanding the frictions and contradictions of the capitalist organization of higher education is integ integral to understanding who, how, and why fights against it. Fourthly, the movement is abolishing the status quo, replacing it with itself, establishing a new order. The task of critique is therefore also to point to these elements in the current configuration of higher education systems, which by opposing its capitalist organization can provide an alternative to it. In my work, but also in today's intervention, I will try to propose such an integral Marxian view of the problem. Also the problem of capital in higher education, uh, as it is a threefold problem, but a research problem, a political problem of uh, crucial importance, and also a problematic way of framing relations in the sector, meeting not only with the lack of understanding, but also with opposition uh, from many activists and researchers. So I would propose that this may be at some point too abstract uh, contribution is an invitation to simply um, opens up new lines of not only researching, but most first and foremost political activity that combat capital in its core and appearance in higher education. Focusing for a moment on the latter, the research problem and uh, resistance to posing the research problem in these terms, uh, one of the dominant Western scholars of higher education, Simon Marginson, and he's not alone in this, his stance, has for many years objected to treating higher education as an area that can be reduced practically and analytically to the issue of capital understood in Marxian terms. On the one hand, uh, this would allegedly be an example of economic reductionism, which ignores the fact that most universities and academics direct their efforts towards other issues and values, like the public good, prestige, or making the results of their work freely av available to others. Secondly, uh, the objection goes that the knowledge, which would be the primary re resource of higher education systems, does not lend itself to privatization. There is nothing more paradoxical than knowing on one's own. Uh, an idea increases its power when it's shared rather than protected from others. And thirdly, uh, the objection states that the nation states have their own interests that are not aligned with the imperative to com uh, commercialize higher education. While all, all of this observation may be considered accurate, each of them explains some important element of the specificity of higher education. They are unable to counter the argument that the result of the expansion of capital in the sector 
our common situation is becoming increasingly difficult. I call this position exceptionalism, and it is more functional towards contemporary capitalist as expansion in the sector, seeking to prove that the sector is somehow immune to it, than critical of it. So I conclude that in order to begin to see the ways in which capital operates in the sector and to wage effective battles against it, we need to change a perspective. A minor but a fundamental change is needed. While most analytical approaches to the commercialization of higher education use the notion of the market, privileging individuals entering into acts of exchange, whether they be people, researchers or students, or institutions are, uh, as market actors, we need a perspective that looks at the relationship uh, and the ways in which they are established. So, according to Marx, capital is totality striving to enclose and subsume the whole of social and biological life under its self-expanding movement. Capital is not a thing, but a commodity-mediated social relationship. It is a value in motion. All these pointers allows us to look at the global reality of higher education sector from a slightly different angle. And having taught Marx capital for years, I know how difficult, if not impossible, it is to lay out the perspective of three marks and volumes on the one slide. Uh, however, let's try to get even a little closer to the understanding of, of what's contained in Marxian capital. If one looks at global higher education uh, as a whole, then the element that lends itself intuitively uh, to the easiest analysis in Marxian terms is the question of production of higher education in private or quasi-private and profit-driven institutions. In peripheral countries such as Brazil and India, but also in many peripheral places in the United States, huge masses of students attend aggressively for-profit institutions offering fee-based education. Just as Marx in the first volume of Capital equated similar educational institutions to sausage factories, here too we can sometimes even directly apply Marx's categories. The employed, labor force, uh, uh, the employed labor force of academics is subject to open exploitation. How else can we call one Brazilian lecturer teaching 10,000 students online in one semester? The problem begins when we want to apply our categories to the reality of the public sector in many, including peripheral countries. At times of the intensity of work in the institutions of the sector uh, resembles the reality of a factory, but in the end, it, it is not the same relationship, sorry, relationship of subordination. Two other figures of cop, uh, capital are, in my view, more relevant to understanding the overall circulation of industrial capital in higher education. Fin financial capital and commercial capital, uh, merchant capital. Uh, both have the function of capturing the surplus value produced in production. On the one hand, finance capital provides credit in exchange for interest. On the other hand, merchant capital sells the institution's output, accelerating it, its circulation. In case of central institutions, the role of finance capital through credit, exam for example, student credit, but also investment uh, credit, boils down to incre increasing the scale of production of institutions that derive at least part of their profits from paid education. For peripheral systems, the role of financial institutions is of somehow, a somewhat different nature. Take the example of the World Bank presence in Ukraine right now, forcing the gradual closure of more universities in exchange for further tranches of loans. In the long term, the peripheral systems with the help of financial capital is to be reduced to a dependency on the education, educational centers. A similar function was performed by the World Bank in African countries uh, or was tried in, in Poland during the transition period, uh, emphasizing that these are not countries that can and should afford their own sovereign higher education. Therefore, they rely on the sending their uh, youth to the centers like to the UK and other, uh, uh, other central uh, spaces filling the pockets uh, of the central institutions with their scare man. 
The role in this process, however, is played also by merchant capital, which at the point I would like uh, limit to academic publishers like Elsevier, Springer Nature, or MMDPI, and data vendors like Relix and Clarivate. Uh, that is, all these entities that make money from serving the peripheral dream of modernizing systems by participating in the race for places in global university rankings. Universities and ministries are, uh, all around the world are not exempt from this madness. Unsurprisingly, only the most central institutions are spared uh, this insanity to the greatest extent. It is not uncommon, however, uh, that in systems such as Poland or Romania, a uh, large part of the always too scarce public funds goes to fund the publications or consultancy. So com uh, merchant capital always appears at the beginning of the overall capitalist transformation of a sector or a country. It all, uh, uh, also now stands at the center of the capitalist transformation of the global higher education landscape. Its task is to create both the links and measures of the always initially different and heterogeneous elements of the system. It is largely publication-based criteria and bibliometric measures of global university rankings that have contributed to creation of a single space of the global university intersected by numerous hierarchies. Uh, if one of the questions of today's session is how to capture the process within the capitalist reality of higher education, my answer is to try to ilum illuminate the ways in which, in different contexts, capital establishes its relationship with academic labor. A tool, uh, okay, five minutes, uh, right now, right now, okay, uh, I will finish for sure, uh, or I will be even briefer, okay. Now, so, so, uh, a tool for this purpose is the Marx and notion of subsumption under capital. Notwithstanding the fact that capital is certain totality, encompassing today the entire planet and a little of its uh, external environment, uh, within this totality we are still confronted with the diverse dynamics. Higher education centra, uh, certainly represent a sector in which the process of capital's transformation, for various reasons and in various geographical contexts, has not yet been completed. Using a Marxian vocabulary, we are able to understand and thus better uh, oppose uh, these processes in our local context, without forgetting that they are part of a global whole. The notion of subsumption also makes it possible to historicize the encounter between capital and labor, emphasizing that it is always an encounter between two ontologically different realities. So, but uh, let me skip this to the issue of struggles to finalize on time. But how do we fight against capital understood in this way? Is it possible to escape the traps set by it? And uh, the critic of political economy can explain many of the processes taking place, but it rarely provides ready-made prescriptions for calling into being a movement uh, uh, to abolish the status quo. On the contrary, uh, contrary, the explosive actions of, of a movement are able to open up new areas calling for reflection and analysis. Recently in Poland, Ukraine and many other places in, in Central Eastern Europe, Serbia is another example, there has been a growing student movement attacking the vices of false capitalist modernization in the peripheral higher education. Uh, in the, the city where I came from, Poznan, last year, a month-long mobilization of students affiliated to Workers' Initiative and Anarcho-Syndicalist Trade Union that also include working students resulted in a strike against the sellout of the Jovita public dormitory. The students raised uh, the issue that, Polish, uh, that in uh, Polish universities dominated by the discourse of academic excellence and the pursuit of rankings and points for publications, students, despite formally free education, do not have the opportunity to actual, actually study. They have to work, most often in precarious jobs. The sale of dormitory uh, only undermines their weak position and exemplifies the antisocial university policy across the country. The strike succeeded in achieving a temporary victory and the demands that arose in the process formed the broader program of the now rapidly growing student movement. It is the 
first openly anti-capitalist social movement in Poland uh, after 1989, uh, I must admit. But uh, to cut uh, the long story short, because we can discuss that uh, during the discussion, I would say what, what is really promising is the constant interrelation between learning the capitalist reality of higher education which students do during the seminars meetings self uh, educating uh, political meetings and their action to uh, actually together with the comrades in ukraine and italy to form an active uh, active and broader students movements that would uh, target the capitalist reality of their societies and the university because as i emphasize in the opening of this intervention there is no possibility of liberate one without liberating the two. For, for this reason, thinking about the uh, political economy of uh, uh, higher education and the university is always is and must be always tightened up with the broader social struggle for li liberating the society from the capitalist and enslavement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christian. Um... That was great, uh, a very stimulating uh, presentation, uh, and uh, it gives also a good uh, starting point to now move on to uh, the to Nabil, uh, and then and then on to Mikhaila as well. Uh, so uh, our next presenter uh, is Nabil Imtiaz, who's from uh, originally from Pakistan. Uh, and he is an activist and design educator. And uh, at the moment, Nabil uh, teaches design at an international school in Tallinn. Uh, and also there in Estonia, he provides non-legal support to refugees in the European Union. Uh, and uh, Nabil has a particularly interesting perspective of being able to compare uh, his experience uh, as an activist uh, organizing political dissent campaigns uh, uh, in Pakistan uh, and also uh, more recently now in, in Estonia as well. Uh, so having that comparative perspective from, from both contexts. Uh, so Nabil would be uh, really grateful for your insights uh, and the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you guys hear, firstly hear me and see the screen? Yes, we can both hear you and see the screen. All right, That's thank you great. so much for giving me uh, space to, to talk about this particular topic and particularly uh, from Pakistan's perspective. But I would like to have like a bit of a disclaimer that uh, this is basically like a case study. Uh, and what I'm doing is that I'm using this as like a departure point to have like a more inquiry into other post-colonial contexts or like post-occupation context. So my intention over here is to highlight uh, <clears throat> like these colonial residual infrastructures uh, as Anne Laura Stoller also mentions these, and to check and see how that colonialism has ended, but in such sort of post-colonial context, these uh, ruins of the infrastructure of this colonial regime uh, are still very much proliferating. Uh, and uh, Maria briefly touched on this as well in their presentation, and I would have like a tiny bit of departure point from here. So I would be talking about students, unions and the struggle for democracy, uh, particularly starting from Pakistan. So just to give you a tiny bit of context that um, Pakistan uh, didn't exist as a state up till 1947. And this is roughly the boundary that I am drawing over here. Uh, so this entire region was basically the subcontinent and Pakistan was part of, uh, or India was part of British India uh, as a key colony of the British Empire from 19, uh, from 1858 uh, eight till 1947. However, their rule uh, gradually started from 16th and 17th century. So this is the map of Indian Empire going back uh, from 1915, uh, where uh, you can see modern day India and modern day Pakistan. Uh, and this is the flag of British India. So over here, you can see uh, this flag was mainly used during the same period. And you can see the Union Jack over here uh, in the upper left corner to represent the British authority. And the, remind, uh, and the remainder of the flag it consists of this dark blue uh, field with the Star of India embedded in the center, which brings me to the British India military, which was the 
which was predominantly the composition of British generals with mainly Indians as soldiers serving at bottom hierarchies. Um, and they were heavily deployed during World War One and World War Two. And this is uh, an image of Indian infantry uh, in uh, Acropolis in 1844, right uh, during the um, the the which was like the the major time during World War Two, um, and not trying to make things irrelevant, but these are the main insignias that were used during British Indian uh, Army, uh, and these are basically your major generals, and then the field officers, and then the ranks basically go a bit at the lower. However, uh, just briefly talking about the chief characteristics of British Indian Army. Uh, their main characteristics were uh, suppression of internal dissent because uh, the British army was like a key apparatus for maintaining colonial order and it used to uh, extensively suppress uprising protests and resistance movements, uh, which was uh, which was mainly the part of the empire. And then you have another chief characteristic of uh, racial doctrine uh, where uh, the the people inside the military were basically uh, distinguished or privileged with certain ethnic and religious groups that were deemed inherently inherently more warlike. So people who were coming from the mountains were considered to be like generally warriors, while the people who were living on the grasslands or right next to the rivers were considered to be farmers. So these were the stereotypes that they the the army started, uh, and of course it was based on segregation and racial hierarchies. Uh, and now the most interesting thing for me is that their focus was on not only on external defense, but was also uh, internal defense as well. Uh, and they were very good in counter insurgency uh, separations as well, which is the suppression of rebellion and unrest through punitive action. So just to give you a glimpse, like these are all the major student activism uh, characteristics as well that they were sort of working against. But however, I would now try to connect it uh, with the per particular topic. So in 1847 was the creation of Pakistan, which uh, is also the perpetuation of colonial logic of governance as well. Uh, uh, so now I would bring this image over here just to have a comparative analysis uh, or just a brief analysis that all these ranks Basically, when it comes to their morphology, when it comes to their color, as well as their uh, their names are similar, with the exception of the fact that the queen's uh, crown over here has been replaced by a star which sort of represents uh, somewhat an Islamic republic of purity and, uh, uh, and struggle. Uh, so Pakistan itself means uh, the land of the pure. So uh, while the country was was newly created, the entire infrastructure was basically uh, inherited from the colonial governments. And there, then there, you have these continuities between uh, between the colonial governance structures as well as uh, the Pakistan military after it got its independence. So uh, the, the Pakistani military had its reliance on colonial military framework to ensure institutional stability initially. And the Pakistan military in its early years had uh, entrenched or de have deeply had deeply penetrated into civil military imbalances and the inheritance basically facilitated this uh, army's consolidation of power within the state often perpetuating colonial logic of governments that uh, emphasize control over citizens rather uh, democratize uh, participation or development. So the idea over here was to really have control over the citizens and the Pakistani army operates right now as well on the infrastructure and institutional skeleton of uh, the colonial army uh, of of the British India. And it has repurposed it into fit the strategic, political and cultural needs of the post-colonial state while returning uh, while retaining most of its original dynamics of like hierarchy. Uh, initially, it was like uh, for institutional st stability. But as I have mentioned, it saw its uh, con continuation. Uh, and going maybe like 10 seconds into Pakistan's uh, political situation. Uh, so Pakistan has intensively uh, suffered from military regimes and coups. Uh, and it's very unfortunate for me to say uh, 
Uh, but on none of the prime ministers since 1947 has ever completed their tenure. So it's probably the only democratic quote unquote country where there is a constant proliferation of military. However, military since 2018 has not had a coup. However, they exist in this hybrid regime, uh, which is called the establishment, which is basically this like uh, dominant social group of uh, elites or oligarchs that you can call in Pakistani context, uh, which is basically the military. Uh, and uh, yeah, so military was very much afraid of the students ever since the beginning. And uh, so since this has gone through like this, the country has gone through this entire political trouble, uh, all of these president, all of these military presidents have had uh, faced student mass uprising. So in 1869, there was this mass student uprising, which ended up reducing, uh, which ended up putting this particular person out of power. However, other presidents or the military leaders basically learned from this regime. And right now, from eight, 1984, all the student unions have been banned from working in Pakistan. Uh, so they, you cannot establish any student union. So 1984 was called as the murder of Pakistan's student unions. So in that case, the student union cannot really work. So this was also the time when neoliberalism was encroaching academia. And it was very difficult for, for students to have their spaces and they were highly demotivated, demoralized. Uh, yeah, so this was also the murder of the academic history as well. So just to give you an example, so this is basically uh, the university that I graduated at, and I'm going to go on its main page. And I, so if you go on downloads and you take a specimen of undergrad uh, undertaking, sorry, uh, you're going to find out this document that all the students need to sign before they get admission into the university or and over here, it basically says that you are not allowed to, uh, you, I shall not indulge in any political activity, including unionism or political grouping. So this is this just gives you like a glimpse of how deeply messed up the system is. But uh, in early 2000s, the system started recovering. It was initially in student circles. Uh, with tiny groups, they did not want to have mass grouping. And the thing with this student circle is that one circle would then somehow get connected with other circles. And this is how the dispersion of information started happening within the university boundaries. And this was uh, these circles interacted with one another was this indication of the recovery of the student fabric. Uh, however, I would talk about what's the situation right now. So we cannot call our student solidarity groups as student unions. However, this has, of course, led to the creation of a plethora of multiple organizations like Student Solidarity March, which since uh, 2018 onwards have been uh, doing marches against the restoration of student unions, uh, even after 37 years. Uh, then we have Women's Watch, which is this uh, student female student wing, along with a Students Action Committee, Progressive Student Collective, uh, and Progressive Student Federation. And as I mentioned, that every year there's this march, and this in Urdu says that this is Student Solidarity March. Uh, and then uh, the student organizations are basically not only protesting on the streets, but they are also organizing these uh, academic discussions as well on militarization, as well as land development and gender equality. And yeah, I basically come from the city of Lahore and uh, I, I see I, I might have three to four minutes left. So I would just quickly talk about what I have been doing. Uh, so we have been trying to repoliticize public spaces because the city of Lahore is a very political city and there have been a lot of uh, yeah, political movements that have emerged, particularly for the students. So since there is this ban inside the universities, we have asked the students to come uh, in spaces uh, like these in order to like organize meetings and events. And we have had street theater as well, where the idea is just to temporarily occupy the space and enact this political uh, street theater, which is kind of metaphorized in a very Orwellian way. Uh, and also we have used uh, spaces that has been very politically inherent in nature uh, to also organize meetings uh, as well. And then uh, we have worked with this 
collective which is called Girls at Dhaba. Dhaba is this informal restaurant that basically exists on the streets, which is this feminist collective where they're trying to occupy spaces and we are using these spaces in order to uh yeah in order to sort of discuss politics and get back into the mainstream politics as well as try to trying to like understand the current problems using uh, uh this social anarchist uh lens uh and yeah so this is what has been happening in pakistan uh but in estonia i would just briefly touch on one in one case one uh, thing that i organized a few years ago and it was called what's the difference which was this uh this politi this student activism campaign in graphic design and urban studies uh, where the idea was to revoke the fee difference that was newly introduced in between these two programs and then we ended up having uh, this entire exchange with uh, the student council as well as the ECA council where we were asking where is this fee difference coming from uh, and these answers were not met by us uh, they, they were not given proper answers by the authorities that we were conducted while they were just giving us one-liner answers and this really pissed us off so we ended up making this campaign which is called what's the difference and why the difference in between different languages of the students who are coming to the arts university uh, and finally, after a few years, we ended up, uh, after a few months, actually, we ended up getting this great news that the student, uh, that the university has revoked the decision between the fee difference in between EU and non-EU students. So uh, it's basically balanced out. However, I would end up with this uh, thing, uh, this last piece of news that Estonia basically wants more third country students to come into uh, the university, which is like an indication that the country is basically trying to uh, have their earning from the from from this British uh, sort of uh, education institution as well. However, uh, this puts a lot of student students into like this precarious position into working more and working in these like caring jobs so however while the situation in our university got a little bit better the future of this is quite bleak so i would stop over here uh, am i on time or do i have uh okay. well perfect you, you it's 15 minutes i mean you you're welcome to stop here uh and then edit a bit more later or if you have sure. one or two final comments you yeah you'd like to stop uh, here I think, yeah uh yeah i i would i would stop over here great yeah thank you so much and um, great to see a designer here the power the presentation is so different like how dynamic you are just shifting in the different bits um it's uh, very refreshing to to have this different way of presenting um stuff yeah uh so now we're finally reached our uh, last presentation for today last but not least uh, and uh, we are returning back to Ukraine after uh, all this bigger overview and the, and the more specific cases from different contexts. Uh, so returning back to our Ukrainian context. Uh, and uh, our final speaker is Mikhailo Samsonenko, who is an activist of the independent student trade union Tremadia uh, and the coordinator of the social legal department there. Uh, he is also a master's degree student of international law at the Tarashevchenko University in Kiev, and he's been researching the recent higher education reforms in Ukraine, specifically the reform of state funding of education, which came to be the topic of the article that he wrote for Commons uh, titled Grants and Forced Employment, whether Ukraine's higher education. So those of you who haven't read it, you're welcome to uh to to look it up uh and Mikhailo the floor is yours uh mm -hmm. okay thank you very much for um uh, for invi inviting me for this meeting and uh, I would actually like to cover some topics uh some of them are not very new for us as a student union and for the Ukrainian context as a whole, but some are more uh, relevant to what's happening right now. And um, basically, um, what, where I'd like to start is to say that uh, there are certain tendencies in how uh, the Ukrainian higher education system is being uh, reformed right now by the current uh, leadership of the Ministry of Education and Science. And um, the main uh, aspects of uh, the educational reform that is being uh, carried out right now 
are first of all the what they call a modernization of higher education facilities network. Secondly, it's an introduction of a grant-based system of education funding. And the third uh, one is a, a kind of an experiment, an experimental uh, reform to change the way uh, through which uh, universities are managed and uh, funded as well uh, through uh, strengthening uh, a specific body at the university, which is called a supervisory board. Well, I'll get into details uh, about each of these three aspects um, uh, right now and, and tell about how they actually uh, pose a real threat to what is left uh, from the uh, accessible higher education that we have in Ukraine and uh, don't actually bring about any changes in how uh, to make it more uh, uh, high quality, uh, yeah, so making it less accessible without even trying to make it more high quality and uh, basically failing at every level possible. Uh, so first of all, <clears throat> what is called uh, modernization of the network of higher education facilities in Ukraine is uh, simply a policy of systemic merging of Ukrainian universities so basically merging a small university to a bigger one and uh, this policy has been widely opposed by students and by administration uh, actual administrations of universities as well and uh, as a result uh, some of these mergers were cancelled uh, but some actually came about and so in the first half of the uh, year, we talked about such universities as, for example, uh, Tavrida National University uh, in Kiev, uh, Ukrainian printing, uh, Ukrainian Academy of Printing in Lviv, uh, which uh, were um, uh, on their way to be merged with bigger universities. Uh, and uh, Premadia uh, took active part in student resistance against these mergers. And so the, first, the former one, the Tavrida National University in Kiev, actually wasn't merged at the end of the day. It, was, it remains an independent university as of now. Um, there were some protests, but also I have to say there was, there, there was some uh, interference by a certain uh, governmental um, persons and um, structures uh, that actually uh like made this uh merger uh no no longer relevant and uh, they uh, actually persuaded uh, the ministry along with the protest by students and uh by the um professors as well uh, to actually stop this merger at uh, Tavrida National University but uh, the Ukrainian Academy of Printing in Lviv is an example of a um, of a university that was merged and that was emerged to uh, the um, uh, Lviv uh, Polytechnic uh, National University. And uh, what the ministry was trying to say, um, it was trying to persuade everyone that this step was necessary. And they explained that the modernization was done in order to make universities more compet uh, competitive on the market and for Ukraine uh, to get uh, another loan by uh, the World, World Bank uh, of uh, $200 million. And um, there is no wonder that the World Bank promotes such a policy as it is actually committed to bring about deregulation and uh, neoliberal approach to public sector in uh, basically any country that it loans money to. And Ukraine here is no exception. And um, furthermore, the problem with this policy uh, is not only that it uh, uh, ruins uh, some uh, some unique universities and uh, doesn't um, take into any like it doesn't take into account the uh, position of students and of those people who teach at those universities. Uh, they also um, kind of uh, there there was this uh, uh, idea that uh, those universities that were merged would get. Uh, more funding. So there was the uh, promise that each 
a merged university would get uh, one and a half million dollars from the World Bank uh, in order to like be developed and uh, to uh, basically be modernized. But uh, uh, if we talk about the Ukrainian Academy of Printing, it didn't happen. And as of now, the university didn't get anything and uh, no money has been received. So uh, this uh, has also been uh, kind of, a, uh, I don't know what to call it, lie or a miscommunication. But uh, anyway, it's not what the ministry was telling us about. And uh, another problem is that aside from cutting down on some unique universities, this reform poses a threat to uh, how university property is managed because um, uh, there, there, has, uh, there has been uh, an introduction of a draft law on uh, state budget for to, uh, 2025. And um, basically, uh, there is a proposal in this draft law to uh, privatize the property of the liquidated universities and um, so to explain the uh, like the context uh, right now it is uh, prohibited by law to privatize property of public universities uh, and uh, to privatize those universities themselves in Ukraine. Uh, however there is this proposal to suspend the effect of this uh, rule and um, to allow for property of the merged universities to be sold out. And this means that uh, more and more facilities are to be uh, privatized. They could have been done, they could have been used to uh, provide public education, to provide various other services to students. So th those uh, could include uh, dormitories and uh, other facilities that uh, belong to, to those universities. But now they can be privatized and commercialized. And uh, this, this draft law is still in the works. It hasn't been passed yet, but uh, the Education and Science Committee of the Parliament uh, of Verkhovna Rada uh, here in Ukraine has actually approved of such change. And that's a huge uh, problem with, uh, like, it's a very threatening step uh, for public education in Ukraine because the privatization of such uh, facilities is uh, quite a problem uh, that is posed, uh, one of the many problems that is posed for public uh, sector of education here. Uh, but that's not to say that right now, uh, the property of universities is not commercialized because, uh, for example, if we take uh, the university where I study, the um, Tarasovchenko National University of Kiev, uh, for example, it uh, um, turns out that uh, as of now, there are around 49 business centers and residential bu buildings that are built on the territory that belongs to the university. So uh, the territory is leased to some private uh, actors. And uh, even though the law prohibits to transfer state land into private hands, it does not, um, like the university does not have the right to build but can act as a customer and in this case the university does not pay anything and the de developer uh, promises to give something to the university and this is how they uh, actually give uh, give away the land of universities and uh, uh, basically privatize it uh, or well to be precise we can say commercialize it uh, and um, what uh, all else can be said about uh, reforms. Well, I, I guess I will uh, stop uh, um, at the uh, merging uh, reform right now, but I will move on to the next one, which is uh, no less uh, threatening and, uh, uh, well, driven by some real uh, neoliberal tendencies uh, in, in the... Uh, sphere of education and uh, this is a reform of um, funding of education it uh, actually paves a way to cut st state funding in higher education uh, gradually substituting it with a mixed system of funding as the uh, for example the main talking head of the ministry of education and science and science says uh, who is this is a uh, mikhailo vinitsky who is a uh, deputy 
a minister of uh, education and science. So he says that there is a need to uh, actually lower state funding of um, education, higher education in Ukraine and to substitute it with a mixed system. Uh, what this means is basically uh, that there will be um, uh, that there is an introduction of a grant based system and it is supposed to supplement the existing state funding uh, system, but it is clear that the final goal of this reform is uh, to uh, diminish state funding and uh, to replace it with the grant based system. So um, there has been an unsuccessful attempt to pass a law that would, uh, first of all, implement the grant-based system to partially replace uh, the full state uh, funding of education. And uh, here I would like to get into uh, a bit more detail, but uh, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, basically, right now, uh, it is provided by the law that uh, the number of state-funded places in universities all across Ukraine uh, uh, has to be equal to at least 50% of the number of people uh, who graduated from high school uh, in the given year. Uh, and um, the draft law on this grant based system provides a quite different percentage because this 50% of those graduating, graduating high school uh, will get either state funding uh, or a grant. So uh, the grant does not necessarily cover 100% uh, of the tuition uh, and uh, given the rapid growth of uh, tuition costs in Ukraine, uh, it actually uh, will most likely cover much less uh, and those students receiving grants will not be eligible for any scholarship. And uh, second of all, this law uh, also provides that those students that receive the full uh, state funding uh, and can receive uh, scholarships, um, they will have to work after this, uh, after their education uh, is uh, done uh, in order to basically reimburse the money that the state paid for the tuition. And uh, this is a huge problem that brings us to the other um, aspect of how education here changes. It's the uh, bringing of the private sector into like the interference of uh, private sector into the field of public education. Um, basically, uh, if we if I continue on uh, with this uh, draft law on grant based system of uh, funding, uh, this there is an alarming change that uh, uh, provides for strengthening of the role of employers uh, in the formation of this uh, state funding. Uh, so basically the amount of money that will be uh, provided for uh, students to, uh, to study for free and to get to scholarships as well. Uh, so basically they propose to um, take into account uh, the proposals of the joint representative uh, body of the employers, uh, which is the Federation of Employers of Ukraine. And um, basically, uh, there is obviously there is no uh, intention to uh, take into account proposals of the unions, for example. They only take uh, into account the um, position of employers and the interests of the market uh, in order to basically subjugate the uh, higher education system to the private sector. And um, it, of course, also does not, uh, like, it will not contribute to any favorable working conditions for students because, uh, as I said, uh, those who uh, those who got the full st state funding of education, of uh, like, the tuition is paid for by the state, they uh, will have to uh, work and they have no choice because if they don't uh, like work for a an employer that is they cannot choose but that uh, gives the proposal to 
uh, for them to work for them after their um, studying is over. Uh, like uh, they uh, um, cannot choose the position, they cannot choose the employer. Um, most of the time, it's just uh, like uh, on it bases uh, entirely on this decision of such an employer, which could not only be the state, but also private employers as well. And um, another, uh, another way through which uh, the private sector tries to interfere with the public education right now is this uh, introduction of um, uh, another experiment. Actually, the Minister of uh, Education and Science, uh, since its proposals are rarely uh, of any success, they try to experiment a lot, actually. So, for example, this grant-based system, they decided not to, uh, like, they couldn't manage to pass the law through uh, the parliament, um, and uh, it's still, like, uh, under, uh, um, like, it, it has still not been passed, but they decided to bring about uh, an experimental grant system, which in and of itself is not uh, a bad, uh, um, uh, like, um, is not uh, a bad thing because uh, it basically uh, brings grant uh, system that supplements the current state funding system. So uh, those who would, uh, like, th those who couldn't have uh, gotten the state funding uh, because they didn't, uh, like, they didn't, weren't very successful at the exams um, after high school, they can manage to get at least some uh, of their tuition costs covered by this grant. Yeah, but this is, uh, like, if the ministry is trying to show that this system, this experimental system, is what the future, the full full-scale um, grant system will look like, this is a lie because, in fact, uh, if they do implement it like on the full scale, it will diminish the state funding and it will, uh, at the end of the day, like diminish the accessibility of higher education. Um, yeah, and another thing is uh, supervisory boards at universities uh, that uh, uh, are like a part of another experiment by the ministry. And uh, it's uh, basically, um, right now it is uh, an experiment that is implemented at three universities in Ukraine. Uh, I would like to talk at least about one of them, which is the Kyiv Aviation Institute. This is what it's called right now. It used to be called the National Aviation University uh, for a long time, but since quite recently it, it was remained, uh, renamed and reorganized. So uh, basically it is reorganized into uh, something that is managed more like a business because it is now a uh, what is called the uh, state um, non-profit enterprise. And uh, what changes for this university is that there will be a supervisory board uh, that uh, that uh, consists of seven uh, members uh, who cannot be university employees. And uh, as um, it was stated that the supervisory boards of universities will include uh, external uh, experts, um, representatives of government, education and businesses. And uh, some CEOs of major companies will be able to share their management experience as, and implement best business practices, as they say. So basically, it's another way for uh, businesses to uh, subjugate higher education to their interest and to manage it like, like a business, which is uh, another huge problem and a crisis situation for public education here. Um, so, speaking of this uh, Kyiv Aviation Institute, or uh, as it used to be called, National Aviation University, it uh, actually, um, like, I could see the why they want to implement the system, because there is uh, really a crisis of uh, how the state funds universities, because it's uh, the system is quite bureaucratized and uh, uh, they don't feel like they can manage 
their own money, but um, as a whole, this phenomenon is obviously negative for um, the ed for higher education as a common good and not as a service or a commodity, because uh, basically uh, it brings about this uh, major influence of the private sector. So now this university uh, is uh, partly founded also by the private sector, and uh, as the um, um, as the um, president of this university has stated, uh, the private companies that uh, can fund the university, like uh, can uh, build some uh, laboratories, uh, bring uh, some uh, equipment and so on, they uh, can be like interested in uh, actually doing th such things uh, like uh, equipment and uh, laboratories, uh, but they uh, are not interested in any social development of the university. For example, in dormitories that are in a, a terrible state at this university. Uh, and um, actually the prices, like the tuition costs have also uh, risen in uh, this university as well. And uh, this is a very systemic policy. And uh, the uh, future of this experiment is uh, uh, quite a threat to what uh, we have as a accessible uh, education here. So um, to my mind and to as the position of our trade union, uh, contrary to the proposals and efforts of the government to further commercialize and to privatize education, to bring private sector into managing universities, uh, there need to be radical changes uh, to, to increase state funding and improve quality of higher education, uh, which above mentioned reforms actually fail to do. Uh, so uh, basically, um, uh, there, there, there's been a, an interesting piece of news recently that uh, in the first nine months of this year, the state spent uh, about uh, 88 billion on special uh, pensions for security forces and for uh, law enforcement. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, or at the end uh, of this year, this amount could rise to uh, 120 billion. And uh, at the same time, uh, this is approximately the whole education budget in Ukraine right now. So it's only the pensions for uh, the security, like, uh, I don't mean, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the armed forces of Ukraine, I'm talking about some, um, like, uh, security um, uh, forces, uh, law enforcement and so on. Only the pensions of this, um, of this, um, bodies, uh, they comprise the whole budget of education. So it actually shows how uh, little we spend on education, uh, how little the, sp the state uh, spends and... Uh, um, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I actually uh, went a bit over time. Uh, so yeah, I will uh, be finishing uh, here and uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry, Mikhail. I didn't mean to interrupt you so abruptly. Uh, you will have a chance. Uh, I mean, each one of us now will, will have a chance to, to comment a little bit more. Uh, I just, uh, looking at the time, I realized that we only have 20 minutes left um, for, for our uh, discussion. And uh, uh, I think we should open the floor now for questions, uh, the Q&A. Uh, so all the participants who are here, you're very welcome to... Um, Write your questions in the Q&A uh, chat uh, and uh, we will be able to see them and uh, uh, considering how little time we have, first come, first serve. So please do write your, your comments and your questions um, in the chat. But before we open the floor to, uh, for, for a broader discussion, I promise that I would give each one of you a chance to uh, respond to each other's presentations and comment on some uh, aspects that you found particularly interesting or challenging or problematic or insightful. So, um, and Maria in particular didn't have a chance to uh, do that little bit of her presentation on uh, resistance. Uh, so uh, if we could just do like another really short round, just one or two minutes uh, for each one of you to comment on, on the presentations of each other, and in the meanwhile, while uh, we are uh, 
uh, doing this commenting a bit, uh, um, I invite everybody else to write your questions in the Q&A. Um, so Maria, would you like to, to go ahead? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking if that would be helpful or maybe we can just see who who has responses to each other. I, I think in some way Mikhail's presentation is a counterpart from the periphery and from a war affected periphery interesting to what I'm speaking about. Yeah. So so it seems that the hymn book of uh, higher education in places like the UK is already followed quite neatly in places like Ukraine and uh, and the wars issues are taken, which is, um, you know, the way that uh, universities exploit, um, especially real estate development in order to extract um, land, you know, rent, um, and not extract, they redistribute, you know, it's a, a socialism for the rich. You know, you, you take from the public and give to the privates. And the university is a very useful tool because it is seen as a public agent. It is also seen as an easy um, kind of, it, it's um, seen as credible by banks. So banks invest in universities and they are seen as low risk agents because the states are going to cover any bankruptcy. So in this way, you know, there, there's kind of quite an interesting economy of loans that are given to universities uh, to to develop real estate. But it's quite interesting to see how I think, well, uh, uh, an economy like Ukraine that is eventually and hopefully going to start recovering from war is going to acutely use possibly all the funding to, to build this new kind of opportunities, you know, presented as opportunities. Um, and uh, instead of redistributing towards students that want to study, is going to start uh, dipping into a pool of international students in order to exploit increasingly their fees. It's, a, it's quite an interesting core periphery question. The other thing that I wanted to say, maybe just kind of briefly on the resistance issue is, you know, it's kind of, well, I guess we're all doing this. So it's not something, I, I don't think at present we're in the era of grand gestures of, you know, how to resist. Uh, we, you know, a lot of things are tried and a lot of things are more or less successful uh, in terms of, for instance, research-led advocacy. So a lot of this that, you know, Commons is doing already. The question is, how do we scale it up in a in a way to reach a broader audience that might be interested in researching, for instance, what's the, you know, funding models behind research, real estate development and so forth of the university? Who reads us, you know, in order to understand all of us? Because we do the research. It's out there. Uh, but we read each other, so it's not necessarily a broader kind of public knowledge and the public doesn't seem particularly interested in the way that its money is spent. So how do we change this conversation? How do we make this kind of scandalizing? Um, and especially in an era in which the public is numb, it's numb to war and genocide happening right now before our eyes. You know, a lot of people are turning down the volume because it's too much um, kind of white noise coming from from the media. Um, and how to make research of, uh, you know, funding and employment models, redundant mass redundancies, the implication of the universities themselves in war and genocide and in extractivist kind of research how do we make that a, a question of concern for the broader public in core and peripheries alike? This is, this is, I think, the bigger question that we have to respond because the research is there. No, it's, it's, it's a public secret by now. Nobody is surprised, but nobody is doing anything about it. Sadly, unions aren't doing much about it. I know in your countries, ho hopefully it's different, but I can definitely say that in in the UK, um, these issues are just not a 
not even mentioned for the most part by unions. Okay, precarious employment, possibly, yes, by now, because a lot of precarious employees made points about that. But uh, so, yeah, how do we reverse that conversation? That's my open question to all the, <laughs> to all the other panelists, I guess. Thank you, Maria. Uh, yeah, big, big question that we don't have the time to answer in the 10 minutes, but definitely something to to engage with and continue in, in our uh, future discussions. Yeah, Christian, would you like to, to comment or add a little bit? Um... Mm, I don't really know where to start because there are so many open uh, lines of uh, reflections. I, I must admit there are so many nice commonalities. Uh, in order to respond to Maria's point on how do we make uh, make the points out of our research more listened by the non-public, I would say we have to focus more on uh, making them dangerous. And they are uh, made dangerous only uh, through the combination with actual social subjects, strugglings for whatever case. And uh, But uh, even then the public is numb anyway. Like, Based on this uh, uh, dorms occupation in Poland, we prepared two books with the students, the uh, students themselves written them, and they're like, like super powerful and super accessible, uh, super accessible, loud messages against the status quo. And uh, unless, unless they will be used as a, uh, rocks to throw at the windows of the parliament uh these books will never be read and uh, so 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 uh, we are in the moment of waiting and while we are waiting i see this uh, uh lot of commonalities between the context and uh, two are most depressing one is the uh, nicely described by uh, maria process of unbundling of what it is education through the, the digital capitalists who sell different machines to conduct and deliver the online education making it absolutely undigestible uh, uh, by students so there is this moment of universities becoming i don't know even what but they are definitely as you were saying like not providing any form of meaningful education anywhere they are starting to be state driven mediators between the uh, demands of the private capitalists on the labor markets and uh, powerless students in most of the contexts who are exposed like the international students in the uk to some different financial traps in order to get their dreams about different lives, lives trapped into enslavement, enslavement, which is organized right now by the universities, both in the peripheral context and in the central context. And I think this is the lesson I learned listening to all that. And uh, yeah, that's my, my comments. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Thank you. Uh, Nabil, would you like to, to add something to, to the discussion? Uh, I think I would add on to what Maria and Christian has said, and also I'll comment a little bit on uh, Michalo's work too, that I find a lot of commonality in all the all the works that were presented and also uh, the milking cow situation that has been, uh, that the foreign students have been made in, in UK and also uh, the situation is sort of appearing very much similar in Estonian case as well. Uh, and also, I one thing that I missed out in my presentation was the role of World Bank and IMF, which I think Michalo touched on very nicely. So uh, I I saw this like huge parallel in between this like military regime, colonial empire, as well as like you know financial institutions. So I think somehow all these three aspects are uh, kind of getting highlighted in in all the work. So. It's it, so you know what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in UK, what's happening in Pakistan is is like this evidence that you know all this uh work is part of this global infrastructure of wealth inequality and imperialism yeah um yeah thank you nabil uh mihailo would you like to to add something to the previous uh, presentations 
Well, I I would like to say uh, that uh, this problem that uh, Maria mentioned actually really is uh, like um, I could really relate to uh, this fact that uh, the public is largely uninterested in how uh, the education is reformed. Unfortunately, uh, we've been trying to bring about some discussions like with the students, uh, which were not very popular, but I also should say that uh, the attempts uh, were not uh, like there, there were not many attempts. So uh, I guess we could try more. But uh, anyway, um, it's just really hard sometimes to like uh, to um, agitate and to uh, propagate something when uh, it's uh, not as easy to explain as like just, I don't know, our uh, universities are, are, are being stolen from us or something like that so it's uh, a, a more complex some more complex issues like these reforms that we have uh, are something uh, to be articulated and we need to find a way to articulate it to the public in uh, the most uh, understandable way that would like they could relate to and uh, could uh, understand that this problem actually uh, does uh, concern them and um, it does concern their education, even though it might not like uh, uh, be uh, relevant for the time when while they are studying. Yeah, but still, it will change the whole system. It will change the sy the system where their children will study or any other future uh, like members of the future generations, and it will will change the whole uh, economy actually as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhaila. Uh, there is uh, one question uh, from one of the Facebook uh, listeners, uh, and it is for all four of you. So let me read it out. Um, we only have five minutes left officially, but because this is the last uh, panel for today, it's OK, I guess, if we if we have to overrun like five or 10 minutes max. But um, I'm hoping we uh, I will let you go <laughs> uh, very soon. Uh, so let me read you the, the question that, that came, um, came to us. So it says, public education in Ukraine does a worse job of ensuring high quality, while private but non-profit universities do much better. This creates a perception among people that public universities should really be disbanded or transferred to supervisory boards. So a question for all speakers, can a public university today meet the requirements for quality in the context of spending cuts, and how does this affect the type of struggle in our conditions? Uh, so, although this is a, a Ukrainian uh, context, but uh, yeah, the, the, this is a question for everyone um, because of course there are similar trends in, in other countries as well. Um, would anybody like to, uh, to, to start answering the question? Uh, yeah, Christian. I can start uh, because the question is, I would say, universal, and this is exactly how operates the public, uh, the public in a neo neoliberal capitalist country. I would say we are more and more forced to uh, experience the underfunding of any public sector, uh, while some kind of a private sector developing delivering some kind of a modest quality especially in the post-socialist context so underfunding underfunding of uh, public sector creates a uh, false impression that this uh, type of sector is completely hopeless but this is orchestrated at least in poland from the very beginning of uh, of 90s and there are a lot like different parallel discourses that are hollowing out the public purpose from the public institutions but i would say probably there is no way out of uh, of this trap uh while we will be sp sticking with the public we have to d define that different uh different reality different uh, uh different uh, vision i would say and this uh, this vision is based on the commons of the 
commonifying the public, I would say, taking control over the public and the stage, uh, which is super hard task, I, uh, I understand. But uh, public left on its own, uh, left in the hands of the state and its oligarchy, will never retransform into something uh, that will benefit anybody and that will uh, be understandable by public as something uh, by the audience, public audience. Uh, or the society as competitive with the private. This is what I wanted to refer as as this deadlock of this conceptual ontological, if I may, opposition between the public and the private. This is a dead end uh, of not only reflection but also of, of action, and we have to go beyond that in higher education and general in society. And yeah, thank you. Add something. Go ahead, Maria. Yeah, so so I think, you know, just to continue Christian's thought and to bring Marx back in, you know, kind of, I think we're, we're kind of, uh, a lot of time, the opposition, public, private, conceals this, you know, issue that the state, the bourgeois state is technically a tool in the hands of capital for a distribution of public resources. So, so we're not in a place where you know there's the good state and the bad capital even it's you know we're beyond that we're not even in the place where civil society is the good guys because the civil society is the way for the property at class to use the state to you know protect um its private property basically you know so so we're we're dealing with the place where the whole social organization of university property has to change, yes, as communal, as public, but not in the sense of as state-owned if the state stays the same. So so this is where where I kind of, you know, it is important to defend public ownership, but but public ownership under changed rules of what the public means. I just say one other thing because I think that would be probably the last time I I think I really liked Mikhail's uh, I mean it's not his term but he he said agitate and I'm thinking wow you know probably that's where we are at you know I think the previous when we kind of started organizing the left on the region including the commons and the other you know kind of organizations that I've been in we were more into maybe the organizing stage you know we are going to do the 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 kind of long-term slow process and in the meantime trump gained power a second time through a lot of agitation you know because because there there's a lot of there's something about emotions there's something about you know being able to provoke and to make yourself relevant in different ways that's not always about rational arguments and winning over and i think probably one thing we are not doing enough is that you know, thinking of how to make people really angry again about about ownership, about lack of economic democracy. Let's put it kind of mildly. So maybe that's that's something that we have to think about. You know, as 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 a lesson from today, and in relation to higher education and other places. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, comment, Maria. Uh, yeah, Nabil, Mihailo, any last thoughts before we close um, in response to this question on public-private or more generally? I, I, I would respond to this question uh, uh, because in early 2000s, uh, there was this same situation of the coexistence of like this thriving private sector and an underperforming public education system. So the state ended up turning towards uh, public-private partnership, which was a disaster. Uh, and this was basically the first step towards this commodification of education and this inequality of access. So even like this, as uh, Christian has said, that it requires like a huge structural reform, uh, like this tiny makeshift bandage cannot really work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mihailo? Yeah. Yeah. Any last well, um, thoughts? Any last comments? Right. Yeah. So um, I agree that uh, this uh, whole 
uh, idea of public private uh, partnership yeah it's just about what we have uh, right now as a uh, uh, the reforms and the proposals uh, of our government uh, for the educational system and it is uh, a huge disaster and uh, uh, in fact uh, yeah i agree that the private and public like this uh, dichotom dichotomy is uh, not as relevant as it seems to be and it's really uh, a problem of the whole system and uh, not only in the like the form of ownership uh, but uh, also i'd like to say that um, answering the question directly I, the, there is an important aspect to it is that uh, there are only like two actually uh, like good uh, private universities in ukraine that like the ministry or some liberal politicians show everyone and say that while wow, this look what university should look like and those are the U ukrainian catholic university and the kiev school of economics the rest like we have a lot of private universities that work just like uh uh, like in order to sell out diplomas and uh, just don't to do any research, don't do any contribution to the science and, and so on. And yeah, so it's a kind of a misinterpretation of the situation as well, because there are more uh, public universities that are that work better and more efficient than uh, the private ones in the majority of cases. Uh, yeah, I guess that's the only thing I'd like to say. But uh, yeah, I also agree with the position of the previous speakers on this uh, public-private uh, issue. <laughs> Sorry, I started thanking everyone with my microphone muted. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for these two hours. Um, it was really stimulating and uh, really insightful points that were made. Uh, I'm sorry we ran over time a little bit and we only had time for, for one question, uh, but I'm hoping this is just the beginning of a debate. So we, with Commons, are really hoping to, to develop these uh, topics further. So the conference, the annual conference is obviously just one of the points in, in our work. Um, so we invite everyone to follow, to follow us, to... Uh, uh, to read our materials now with the dialogue of the peripheries project we have quite a lot of stuff actually in english uh, for um for those of you uh, who are english speakers uh and uh, we we invite everyone to to join into in in this discussion and to to write for us uh, to get yeah, to join in in the debates um and uh, looking forward to uh, meeting all of you again uh, I hope um, under more optimistic circumstances. Um, yeah, so thank you very much once again um, and uh, have a nice and safe evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.